I'm so excited for today's panel because we get to discuss the future of tax cooperation uh, with some emerging leaders in the field. So these are the, the very same people that are shaping the future of tax policy. So I think we will have a great discussion. Uh, so the panelists will be tackling some key issues regarding uh, our tax systems. We will be discussing um, how can we make a better place for tax cooperation, especially in light of the uh, OECD global tax deal and in light of the pandemic. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce you to our amazing uh, lineup for today. So, uh, first, we have Christina Dimitropoulou. Christina is a research and teaching associate and PhD candidate in the doctoral program in international business taxation at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. Uh, right next to her, we have Natalia. Natalia is um, a tax policy expert and a PhD candidate in global studies at the University of Urbino. Uh, on the next line, we have Prerna, Prerna Pecheri. She is a chartered accountant and tax lawyer. Uh, she has completed her master's from Vienna University. All right, next to Prerna, we have Elena, Elena Belizzi. Uh, Elena recently joined Wood Mackenzie as head of carbon. She holds a MSc in economics from Bukotni University and an MPA in environmental science and policy from Columbia University. Uh, then we have Joy, Joy Raruguru in Dubai. She is a teaching and research associate at the Global Tax Policy Center of uh, Vienna uh, University. She's also pursuing a doctorate in law uh, with a focus in, on international tax law um, at the same university. Uh, then we have Félix Antoine, Félix Antoine Saint-Marie. Uh, he's a manager for, um, at Raymond Chabot Grand Thornton, where his practice consists of helping and advising SMEs in navigating the Canadian tax system. And uh, right up the screen, we have Jux. Chucks is a graduate student at the University of Florida um, in the International Taxation Program with a concentration in U.S. law. Uh, William Ross, uh, coordinator of Echec au Paradis Fiscaux and PhD candidate in philosophy uh, at the University of Montreal. Uh, donc William est coordinateur du collectif Echec au Paradis Fiscaux et candidat au doctorat en philosophie à l'Université de Montréal. So now it's everyone. <laughs> Um, so to kickstart our discussion, we, as Brigitte mentioned, we have two questions from uh, Pascal Saint-Amand. Um, we asked him, we told him that we were discussing with some of the brightest uh, young leaders in tax policy, and here are the questions that he had for you. J'en ai deux, mais une qui est celle qui est l'objet de, de ta conférence, c'est euh, comment voit-il les choses, euh, comment voit-il la coopération, ça veut dire quoi la seconde question qui est peut-être un, un peu plus ciblée, c'est euh, qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire mieux et comment peut-on mieux faire que ce que l'on fait en pratique euh, Ce n'est pas des idées générales sur à quoi devrait ressembler le monde dans, dans un cadre idéal qui n'existe pas, mais qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire concrètement pour améliorer les choses et faire que le système soit ressenti comme plus juste et plus efficace en même temps. Il ne faut pas oublier que la fiscalité, elle est là comme un moyen, un moyen de financer les États et qu'elle doit être utilisée aussi pour faciliter les investissements, faciliter la croissance, faciliter des emplois bien rémunérés, des emplois durables pour l'humanité et pas seulement dans les pays développés. Donc, étant donné ces contraintes-là, comment voyez-vous les choses On a besoin de vos conseils, on a besoin de votre fraîcheur. Et donc, oui, c'est une question très concrète que j'ai et j'espère qu'on pourra avoir des, des, des bons éclairages. Awesome. So let's start with his first question, which is, um, what does tax corporation mean to you? Um, so I, I don't know if you guys can raise your hands uh, whenever you want to intervene, and I will try to uh, keep track of the order. So who wants to kickstart? Yes, Perna. Thank you. Uh, so according to me, tax corporation is uh, not very clear. I mean, the tax corporation corporation is something where the national interest should be subservient to the certainty which should be given to the taxpayers. In today's time, as we could see that the tax corporation is hampered due to the conflicting national interest 
due to the sovereignty concerns, due to tax competition, due to the mobility of capital. But I think the entire BEPS project and this two pillar project, as well as this BEPS project's main focus was on bringing the coherence and transparency. And this two pillar project, especially the global minimum tax, is trying to attain some form of tax cooperation. But achieving 100% may not be possible in reality, but aiming at least for the taxpayer certainty could be realistic through the tax cooperation between the states. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Natalia, I saw you shaking your head. Did you want to add anything to that? Uh, oh, uh, I don't think that my points uh, relate to this directly, but uh, I can go <laughs> if that's fine. Sure. Um, so I actually thought about this and I think that I see tax cooperation threefold. To me, the three most important things are transparent institutional structures and processes, open decision making on a democratic basis and accountability of institutions if they fail to actually include some policy actors. I'm very much concentrating on um, institutional inclusivity in my work. So I see this as a major part of the issue, providing everyone an actual opportunity to affect the decisions that are being made and an opportunity to be heard and for, for your concerns to be to actually taken into account. And while we obviously made a significant progress on that in recent years, I think we all know that we still have some uh, Areas for development, they call it, I think. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm running out of time, obviously. Very happy to give the floor to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, well, we can move uh, to his second question. So, the second question was concretely, how can we make a better job at building tax systems that are and feel fairer and more efficient? Who wants to comment on that? Uh, I can comment uh, on that uh, because I see this question actually as an extension of the first one. So how do we see tax cooperation is actually how uh, we envision a tax future that is more efficient and uh, fair, which is premised on being more cooperative in an international setting. So for me, uh, investing more in consensus-based decision-making, I think is the key because if we have more consensus-based decision-making, in lack of an international tax government, because we all know that we're not yet there, but we're actually finding for more sustainable alternatives. So I think that will enhance the equity and, for, and equity and efficiency of the tax system. But having an, a, a fair and efficient consensus-based decision-making, I think it's premised also on sharing common goals. And uh, in that question, if, for example, equity and efficiency are those more fundamental principles on which we base our decision making, then I think uh, on the equity aspect, I think there is a lot more work to be done because there is a lot of skepticism on whether uh, our, uh, our approaches or our initiatives are principle based and what does equity mean. Some people say that it's in inter international equity. Which our approach, it's a, which is approached either from the benefit principle or the distributional uh, one. I think if we want to tackle more inequalities, we need to focus on the distributional side. And as far as efficiency is concerned, I think there we have done a little bit better work because uh, if we we agree that uh, efficiency inefficiencies comes from market failures and free riders. There, I think the approaches of the OECD that have already been taken are to the right direction. And so, uh, you know, in lack of uh, the capacity of uh, improving everything, I think that the focus should be on how can we all agree to the best trade-off. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Elena, Chucks, and then William. I'm, I'm happy to go. I think I'm skipping the line a little bit here, but... Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to uh, also kind of go back to the previous question and make a, make a link with this one, uh, because I feel that really the, the two issues are very well, very connected. Um, and I would like to bring the, the discussion back a little on, um, on um, 
carbon taxation as an important instrument uh, to uh, for the future. And really, tax cooperation to me is a means to tackling global problems such as climate change. We all agree that. Uh, something needs to be done in the very short term. But um, as also uh, Mr. Santamon was mentioning, there is a, um, a, a lack of uh, agreement on the instruments that we should be taking. There has been much discussion about a minimum uh, carbon tax uh, in the world, similarly to the minimum uh, corporate tax that was uh, agreed a few months ago. But um, it, it really takes some, uh, some thinking and a, and a very pragmatic approach to understand, first of all, how we can implement something like that while preserving the equity uh, principle and ensuring that countries that um, uh, are low income or that are facing difficulties are, are also allowed um, their chance to, to develop in a sustainable manner. Uh, but also, we need to, to think about what are the, the, the attritions in um, establishing, for example, a, um, a, a global uh, minimum carbon tax, and what is needed to ensure that the energy transition uh, goes on. So uh, just to give you a very, a very concrete example, uh, in the next few years to secure the energy transition, there is going to be a huge demand for metals because they will be needed to basically build any type of infrastructure uh, that you can think of, renewable energy, et cetera. Uh, but uh, there, is, there is also a, a shortage of demand and part of it is because the, these technologies uh, to, to produce metals are still very high carbon. Uh, and that is really a, a, an area where tax policy can support and can provide instruments coupled with other, uh, with other fiscal instruments, such as, for example, um, subsidies or, or incentives to, um, to, to R&D uh, or, um, or support uh, to producers to develop uh, clean mechanisms, such as, for example, hydrogen. And this is a, a pragmatic tool that we can use in a in a in a in an area of tax cooperation and of uh, global understanding to solve a practical global problem. Uh, Chuck, did you want to comment on that? Uh, basically, I'll be just I'll be talking about um, what we need to do, you know, to create a fair and, and efficient tax system. Um, basically speaking, to create a more efficient and um, fair tax system. Uh, we need to take cognizance of um, creating a balance and respect of activities that arises from the mobility of capital. You know, talking about source and destination countries um, in such a way that you know there's coordination amongst the countries to ensure that um, international tax rules are not breached, and most importantly, to also ensure that tax comp competition you know is avoided. Um, it is understandable that countries tend to you know, incentivize investment, you know, by giving out, by giving tax base and all that. And this should be done in the context of international cooperation. So as not also, um, so as to prevent um, issues relating to, you know, on uh, creating undue advantage or in some cases state aid to certain cooperation, which will ultimately um, lead to tax competition. And then of course, um, create an imbalance in the global tax system. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try to uh, merge quickly my answer to the first and second question. Um, so tax cooperation is often thought of as a cooperation between different political actors, which is obviously the, 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 the most uh, uh, like uh, obvious thing that we have in mind when you talk about cooperation. Uh, understood as such, uh, other, uh, we do not explicitly state that tax justice is also just a moment of uh, a larger social and economic justice. So uh, I like to also imagine tax justice, uh, tax corporation as being the recognition that the tax system needs to play a role beyond redistributive uh, justice and cooperate to create like an impulsion to transform society in general, especially where injustices are created. Um, so what, what can we begin with concretely when we say that is that we can start with uh, noticing or always remembering that if there are tax if there are tax injustices it is because there's an economic and political system that produce and endorses this state of affair um actors who benefit from this system often have a say or a reach in the formulation of the tax system nationally or internationally uh, i think that our task lies in the democratization at all levels of the creation of tax policies only then can we establish the transparency and also the accountability mechanisms necessary to break the vicious circle. Thank you. 
Thank you, William. Joy? Thank you. Um, I just, in addition to what my colleagues have said, which are really brilliant um, inputs, I was just thinking, you know, as I was listening, because I didn't want to repeat what anyone said. And I think the one last element that you would need for, you know, a fair and efficient tax system is actually a very practical um, effort towards capacitating your tax administration. And probably in most developing countries, because I recall uh, Pascal also asking about developing countries, it would go beyond just your tax administration. You know, you're also looking into other um, institutions involved in combating illicit crimes or illicit financial flows. So I think it's very important we also have the practical in line, right? We are very much focused at the moment on rulemaking, but, you know, five, six years from now, we're going to have to ask about the practices of the tax administration do they have the tools? Do they have the capacity? Do they have the leadership to guide them towards being more effective, addressing all the issues, not just of large taxpayers, because that's been the focus. Right now we're focusing on multinationals, but also the smaller and medium and micro enterprises as well that are fairly important, especially in developing countries. Um, I think it's also important to focus on the issue of simplicity and certainty, right? When we're talking about administrations, they are only maybe in an average administration, maybe a thousand or so um, individuals involved in implementing the rules, in auditing the taxpayers, in actually following up on the collection of taxes. We have to remember as we continue to introduce more and more complex rules, we are looking to a very small unit with minimum capacity to implement those rules. So I think there's something to be said about fair and efficient administration, but also capacitating for a fair and, and efficient tax administration. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I think that ties in very well to the next uh, question that I wanted to ask you guys. So, you know, as people who are heavily involved in tax policy, I was wondering, um, what do you hope for the tax systems in the future? How would you want them to change? Chucks, did you want to comment? Um, yes, um, thank you, Gabriela. D definitely, in terms of in terms of um, increasing um, global cooperation as it relates to tax issues, there needs to be increased level of openness and, of course, transparency and information exchange. Um, no doubt, there have been there have been information exchange at a certain level now. You know, hopefully, going forward, it's expected that you know more countries will be more open and, of course, transparent in terms of how information exchange. As it relates to taxpayers, you know, as shared amongst um, the revenue authorities across the globe. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Yes, thank you. I, I will bring back the discussion once again to, to uh, carbon taxation. Uh, and uh, for me, the, um, the, the tax system of the future is one that uh, shifts the focus of taxation from income to. Uh, to uh, polluting activities. And um, this um, needs to be done because currently economic activity is taxed in a, in a very indiscriminate manner. So uh, it doesn't take necessarily into account how much uh, 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 environmental degradation or pollution uh, each economic activity is producing. So carbon taxes are a way, uh, in a way, a step in the right direction. But there needs to be, in my view, a really a, a, a change in mentality. And the same goes for, for example, wealth taxes or solidarity taxes. These are all types of uh, taxes that recognize the, the, the relative impact that each person, each economic activity has on society, not just in terms of what they contribute, but also in terms of uh, what they take away from society in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, Prana? Yes, thank you. So according to me, uh, the future looks very much promising and based on more multilateralism. With respect to the fairer tax system, I think the focus should be on having the effective dispute resolution mechanism as well as the exchange of information mechanism in a way that it could bring a kind of multilateralism. So now that we already have the exchange of information in place and dispute resolution, but I think the focus should be not only on building these systems for the large taxpayers, but even, uh, as my colleagues mentioned, even for the small and medium enterprises, so that the dispute resolution is accessible by even the small taxpayers and to bring them the certainty. Thank you. 
Thank you. So I think the order was Joy and then Christina. Uh, thanks. Um, just thinking about it on the macro level, I think um, that as, as international tax rules continue to change and develop, I think it's very, very important that we now focus on cooperation with other disciplines. Um, I think we are learning how much taxation is affecting the investment space, the trade space, for example. And it almost looks like uh, the final frontier towards you know, uh, removing protectionism or eliminating protectionism. So it would be, I think, quite useful and quite important that we begin to engage with these other disciplines in order to understand the implications, but also to already advance um, whatever is happening uh, in, a, in the right direction. So when I say that, I mean, you know, the cases that we've seen with India, the current cases, the Vodafone cases, and we've also seen increasing trade cases at the WTO, and we have new regional trade agreements, the CFTA, the RCEP, um, there are more frameworks coming up, and that means that there's more pressure for taxation to fit into a specific box, and we need to openly address this as well. So for me, future cooperation means becoming more interdisciplinary. Thank you. Christina, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, just uh, something small, because I think everything uh, has been said, but I just want to uh, move a little bit further from what Joy and Elena just mentioned. So for me, uh, if I want to be like a bit romantic or idealist, okay, the future looks more green to me, more digital, more transparent, more fair. So everything comes with the relevant taxes. So I think my generation is a little bit more open to examining new tax bases. While the old tax policy generation, we were kind of stuck between income, uh, consumption, and that's the two tax bases that were kind of monopolizing the discussion so far. But I think now, because of the economic changes uh, that precipitated the new type of thinking, I think we're more open in discussing new taxes. And so I think the future goes towards that way more. But the critical issue here is, again, the implementation and enforcement. Uh, so I think that's a really great pragmatic issue that we need to focus on. We, now we have the technological tools to be able to, uh, to invest more on that. And I, I think there is a lot of capacity there to explore. Uh, but the problem is not only concentrated on developing countries, because I think also a lot of developed countries, they haven't solved the tax administration issues. I think tax processes to a large extent, apart from, of course, some leading countries in the world, are still uh, lagging behind in terms of uh, you know, improvement and the digital uh, development. So I think that's how the future uh, looks like to me. Thank you. Um, you know, for me, I think it's very important to, I think I read this somewhere, uh, to remember that the economy is here to help people and to serve people and not the other way around. You know, people are not here to serve the economy. So uh, I think adapting our economies and our tax systems you know, as we evolve as, as a society and as our values change um, it is very important in order to better serve people. So that being said, I was wondering, um, what do you guys think we can learn from the past um, in order to make our current tax systems more uh, sustainable for future generations? Um, thank you. Uh, I think that one of the successes of the post-war, Second World War, of course, uh, Canadian economics and the social democratic uh, social contract, may I say, uh, lay in the fact that workers were presenting public debates through massive membership in unions uh, in most developed countries at the time. Uh, this created on the one hand, a strong check and balance between the wealthy few and the vast majority of the population. And similarly, on the other hand, led to a period of tax responsibility being fairly distributed through society. Uh, I think this, in this regard, the current hike in equality, inequalities must be thought of in relation with the decline of union representation. Um, so what I get from this is that the past tells us that governments don't offer justice. They have to be urged to actualize it. And uh, stronger union representation creates a condition of a fairer society, not only locally and also uh, on the labor level, but also including leads to a fairer tax system. Felix Antoine, did you want to add to this? 
Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, definitely, we can learn a lot from past uh, from past experience to build a, to build a new tax system or a tax system that's going to be more sustainable. First of all, we have the insight of the mistake we, we made in the past. Uh, one major, and I'm talking maybe more of a from a Canadian tax per perspective, but uh, in building a, a tax system, one of the main objectives should be should be sustainability, comprehensive set of rules, and we must avoid at all costs the the the, the trap or the, the 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 temptation on of making modification, altering the, the tax system uh, for political gain, and and that has been an issue uh, over and over, and resulting in only two consequences, uh, more well two major consequences. Uh, tax systems becoming more and more complex and it creates uncertainty which lead to unfairness and uh, uh, lack of efficiency also. So that's probably the first thing we can learn from the past, but there's also a lot of good thing we can learn from the past, which is uh, we have now, uh, we have the insight of the, what incentive are working and what, which are not. And I think that COVID showed that the response of government during the COVID uh, crisis have showed how better government are getting at grasping the impact of measure for a startup, for SMEs, uh, to help business grow, to influence on cash flow, for example. And I think we are now in a better position to, to put in place incentive to help business grows that will be really targeted and really efficient in, in their application. And, and with that, uh, we can, we can uh, well, we'll, we'll be able to, 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 to have a, a system that is in place for a, a longer time. Thank you. Uh, Joy and then Elena. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think one thing I would point out from our past that to me is almost a demonstrate that we will continue to repeat the past until we learn from it or we change the fundamental elements is actually about tax competition. We've been trying to address tax competition for a very long time. And for example, if you look at where we were in 1998 and the fact that countries said, well, we don't want to address uh, an, the issue of a minimum tax, right? We, we don't want to be managed on the types of tax rates we are able to introduce. So let us only focus on the issue of transparency and you know, tax havens and defining tax havens. And we compare that, so that was you know, around 2000, 1998, 2000, to where we are today in 2021, and countries are accepting that perhaps it is time to accept a minimum tax. Uh, there, it is time to put a floor towards uh, corporate tax competition, let me be very clear. Uh, there's a lot to learn from where we were then and where we are now, and why countries have changed their position Positions. I think quite interestingly, most importantly, the United States changing their position because the, the, at the time, the statement made by the United States was fairly important to why uh, addressing low tax rates was not the focus of OECD's work at that time. So it is very important to look back at why we made the decisions we made at that time. Indeed, even when it comes to financial transparency itself, um, anti-money laundering frameworks. There are decisions that were made that we've had to go back towards and rethink and realize that the positions taken are no longer appropriate today. So there is a lot to be learned, sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes to remove ourselves from the loop of decision-making. Um, but indeed, I do think that because of the way that tax competition has developed, we will be coming back to this issue, whether it's regarding corporate taxation or another type of tax, which is probably the, where the future is going, we will have to openly address um, tax rates in general and tax competition overall. Thank you. I was going to make a, a similar point as what uh, Joy just said in the sense of uh, just highlighting that sometimes uh, implementing policies that are not uh, necessarily um, well thought and that only go halfway is even worse than going uh, than than maybe doing nothing at all or or doing very little because um, just to expand a little bit of uh, the potential uh, strain that it can pose on on tax administrations and uh, of the of the potential uh, negative or or um, uh, distortive incentives that uh, can be imposed on society. And another another uh, thing 
thing that I think we really uh, learned from the past, um, especially in the last few years, is that the key to uh, tax visibility is public acceptability. Without uh, a strong uh, relationship between the government and, uh, and society, it is very hard to uh, introduce new, uh, new taxes. It is very hard to uh, introduce um, policies and systems that in the end are going to be beneficial for the whole of society because they redistribute wealth or they uh, or they again uh, target certain sectors of the economy that are that are causing uh, negative impacts for uh, the whole of society. So uh, establishing a, a clear dialogue with uh, with citizens with the public is really uh, some a, a, an important lesson that we have learned in the last few years. Awesome. So um, does anyone want to add to that? Uh, yeah, just a small comment. Um, to me, uh, I think what we can learn from the past is um, not only just, you know, copying all the solutions that we find, but we just reevaluate what was out there uh, in light of the new circumstances. For example, with, uh, with regard to the minimum tax, uh, this tax comes from the U.S. a uh, long time ago. So the U.S. Uh, implemented it for a long time. Uh, it has been uh, very much criticized. It has been redesigned several times, and very recently it has been abandoned. That was for, for the domestic level, for the U.S. domestic level. But now for the international tax level, it, it turns out that the global minimum tax might be a, a good solution. But for what? For the international tax issues. Of course, there is some uh, similarity between the problems that this type of tax aims to address because of its tax design, etc. cetera. Uh, but it targets different uh, solutions. So uh, my comment here is actually that we have some tools out there. We don't have to always reinvent the wheel, but we have to be able to readjust depending on the new circumstances. Absolutely. Does anyone want to add one last comment before we move on to the next question? Yes, Perna. Uh, I think one thing we can learn from the past is that the, uh, the international tax system is always based on more of the political considerations rather than just being what actually it should be. And I think even if we see the digital project, I think uh, it was started way back in, not even in 2013, but way before that, not even in 2008, but in 1990s. And I think it was still driven by the political considerations and even when we and even when the countries are on table discussing pillar one and pillar two project i think still they are thinking about those political consideration as to how much the project is going to benefit each and every country in terms of the revenue and i think this is how it's going to turn out in the future with respect to every taxation so the taxation policy is not always going to be fair as it seems to be or as it wants as we want to be but it drives more on these political issues with the countries which have it thank you thank you um so for the last question i think we're very lucky to have a, a diverse um set of panelists which each of you being uh specialize in your own specific field. So uh, I was wondering, in your field of expertise, uh, how do you think this tax systems should be um, adapted to foster better tax cooperation and also reduce uh, inequalities? I can go first. I think um, from the legal perspective, given that I'm a legal practitioner, I think one of the issues that we also need to deal with is how countries can transition these international norms, you know, these, these are conventions, these agreements, you know, into their local laws, you know, into their domestic laws to ensure that um, the, the, there is no, there's no conflict per se, you know, between their international obligation as well as their um, domestic laws that should ensure mostly that everything is in alignment. Because it's important that even when countries go at the go to the OECD level or at the international level, and they they accede or accept to join certain frameworks or to, uh, to join certain uh, global agreements, if they're unable to translate that to you know to their local circumstance, to their local laws, you know, to amend their local laws to be in alignment with their international obligation, then of course it will be tough to achieve uh, cooperation at that level. Thank you. 
Thank you. So uh, Natalia, Christina, and then Joy. Yeah, I'll be very quick. Uh, so I think, obviously, I see proper, like, securing proper inclusion of developing countries in international tax policy making as one of key issues. So kind of restoring trust in this system and international organizations. And then I think another very important thing is taking the local context into account and rather than seeking one size fits all solution, just trying to really understand what's going on in a particular jurisdiction. I should probably mention that my field is development if you didn't get it yet. So, uh, so that the policy suggestions that you're providing actually work in this particular context and uh, paying attention to, for example, capacity building of the local authorities and tax administrations, institutions, and all these things organically um, can be of ultimate importance, I think, for achieving these goals. Thank you very much. Christina? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, well, from my uh, research perspective, inequalities are basically addressed uh, by the relation between uh, labor and capital. So I examine uh, the effect of automation and the potential uh, implementation of a bunch of uh, robot-like uh, taxes. Uh, so the issue for me and for the future is how we are defining these two production factors, because I think there will be a radical change not only in their taxation, which is already happening, but also in terms of how we define them, which of course will inform how we are able to tax them in the future. Um, I think that will have uh, enormous uh, uh, implications in the international tax context because, okay, so many countries so far don't see the problem because they have different uh, production um, uh, capacities, uh, but uh, because I think labor is also very much mobile, as we already noted, uh, I think it's going to affect uh, globally all countries in their economic model. So I think uh, unless we have a BEPS 3 coming up, uh, we should at least incorporate those issues in the current BEPS 2 developments. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, very quickly, Joy, uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Okay. Um, Christina, I definitely think our BEPS 3 is probably going to come. Um, I think automation is, is certainly very key and we have, you know, big opportunities around automation to support tax administration, especially where they don't have the capacity to, first of all, evaluate the information they receive. I mean, we have to accept that tax uh, authorities deal with a significant amount of data. And if we want them to effectively implement the types of rules that we are talking about today, we need them to have the tools to actually um, evaluate and then implement, right? Um, the other thing I wanted to say, uh, it's come it's come out, you know, at various times in this conversation, but, um, you know, dispute resolution is key. It will be key in the future, given that the rules are becoming more complex and more complexity means more uncertainty, particularly, particularly as between taxpayers and tax authorities. And there will be a need for greater cooperation be between those two parties, which is very important. Uh, the last point, and I've been saying this, is about cooperation at an interdisciplinary level. If we do not resolve the issue of dispute resolution, we are probably going to face more disputes are arising in other aspects of international economic law. So in the trade aspects, in the investment aspects, and where we have more trade frameworks arising, it's even more of a risk that we will be facing, that countries will want to react towards inaction or overreaction by other countries through other frameworks like the trade framework. So I think that will be very important in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce. So uh, yeah, we have to end it here for today, but um, I'm very excited to keep reading about all of you, you guys' work um, in the future, and I'm going to keep my eyes open. Thank you so much.